Welcome to Season 2, Episode 3 of Ion Horror, otherwise known as Episode 25, <laughs> for those counting the other way. Uh, I'm your host, James J. Edwards, and with me, as always, yet again and forever, Jacob Davidson. How are you doing, Jacob? Doing good and happy to be here on this dreary, rainy Sunday morning. It just started raining down here, too. This is a... Uh, this is good podcasting weather. Sure is. And also with us on this dreary morning is John Korea. You going to brighten it up for us, buddy? Uh, Maybe. We'll see. <laughs> but it is actually perfect because I don't know if you listeners know this, but I live next to a busy street and our mix master maestro and band leader, uh, James, has to deal with cutting that out a lot. So... <laughs> Or not. You, you've you probably heard the motorcycles zooming by. Maybe. But th- what you don't hear is a lot more shit going on. So this is going to be good for James because L.A. people don't drive in the rain. So maybe we'll get some we'll get some great sound from me today. Well, there probably won't be as many motorcycles, at least. Yeah. <laughs> Either that or they're going to be followed by like ambulance sirens. We, we might <laughs> it might be more exciting now. <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? All right, let's uh, let's jump into uh, what we've done this week. I know the big thing that came out this week, which by the time you hear this, you've probably already seen it, John Wick. Chapter 3, Parabellum. Parabellum. And they do explain what Parabellum is, in case anybody doesn't know. It's one of those instances where they say the name of the title all dramatically. Yes. It's pretty awesome. And it's subtitled, so you know what it means. <laughs> it's kind of like how in uh, John Wick 2, someone dramatically went... Chapter two. <laughs> <laughs> they were just uh, like a bit character that was reading and he was really stoked to finish that first chapter. He was in the lobby of the hotel. You might have missed it. <laughs> <laughs> might have missed it. Uh, I know that uh, Korea has already told us we, we can't spoil it because he's seeing it the second we hit stop on this recording. But we're going to go spoiler free. Although you can't really spoil a movie like John Wick because you pretty much know it's just going to be Keanu Reeves beating the hell out of all comers for two hours. I was about to say, does he use guns in this one? Oh, of course. He most certainly does. Yes. Ah, oh, you spoiled it for me already. <laughs> <laughs> he uses more than guns, though. There are some amazingly creative weapons that he uses that uh, that I don't I don't want to spoil for you. We'll talk about it after you see it, because then also all of the audience will have seen it too. But there is, it, and it happens in like the first third of the movie that he uses something that you wouldn't think would be a weapon. Yeah, well, I mean, it's like in the last two movies how he was notorious for killing a dude with a pencil. Can I just say, I rewatched chapter two last night in preparation to watch three today. And just like that opening where he's like, did did you hear he killed him? Three guys in a bar. Yes, with a pencil. With a fucking pencil. <laughs> Who does that? Like Exactly. Well, this one is funny because the main antagonist, and this isn't really, I mean, there's a ton of main antagonists, but this isn't really a spoiler, but the main guy that is um, that is after him, I mean, every assassin in the city is after him because that's the thing. When he goes, it picks up right where chapter two leaves off. So he's excommunicado yeah. from, you know, from the, the scene and everybody's after him. But the main guy who looks like he's going to get him is he's a John Wick fanboy and it's like they'll stop fighting he'll be like can I just say it's a pleasure to meet you I've been a big fan for a long and it's hilarious and he thinks you know he thinks that he's going to be the one to kill him and that's going to be his his big claim to fame I saw a guy and I don't know who this guy was but he tweeted something about how he, he was asking why John Wick was a thing. And he says, it's a boring lead, has boring fight scenes and boring what? action sequences. And yeah, it was, it was on. And people jumped all over him. People are like, I'll do what movies have you been oh. watching? Because I can understand the John Wick series not being your cup of tea. But to say that, A, the lead is boring is just blatantly false. That's just a lie. To say that the fight scenes are boring is ridiculous. Ridiculous, And to say that the action scenes are boring is even more ridiculous because it's like watching one of those shoot 'em up video games. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's all with these long shots where the camera's swirling all around the characters. And it's, oh, it's, it's, it's exhilarating. They're just so much fun to watch. Now, see, I can understand not liking Keanu. Like, I understand. And this is someone who loves Keanu. I mean, fuck, dude, point break all day. But, um... <laughs> But he just doesn't do it for some people. I get that. But again, I can't. You can't argue that the action and the fight scenes aren't incredibly well choreographed. Just like again, what, rewatching Chapter Two last night, that whole scene of him just basically fighting with his car for the opening <laughs> ten minutes. 
was ridiculous and awesome. And the set pieces are always amazing. Yeah. There are some great ones in three, and just every move every movie in the series has had at least one insane uh, set piece for the action. I can even understand you not liking Keanu Reeves in other stuff, but he is John Wick. You, I mean, to say that he's boring as John Wick is like, really? I think he's magnetic as John Wick. It's like, you can't, hey, you can't, you can't not watch him. My only complaint about the John Wick movies and Keanu Reeves is they haven't had him say, whoa, yet. <laughs> that's, that's a staple of all Keanu Reeves movies for me. It's the reason why I think The Matrix is such a classic. It's just, you know, for that one shot where he goes, whoa, after Morpheus jumps. Okay, well, let, let's not dwell <laughs> on John. Just, uh, if you haven't seen John Wick, see it. It is, it, it's two hours of the most fun that you'll have in a movie theater probably this year do you guys watch the footage of keanu going through the gun courses like in real life and doing yes. like the real time like showing that he can actually do this shit he absolutely can he does his own stunts you need to watch those if you haven't and if you haven't also they released videos of halle berry going through the course with like keanu nice. on the side cheering her on yeah dude holy crap man she's like on the same level with that that's what's even more impressive about these movies is Ken Reeves, pro I think I read somewhere he does 85% of his own stunts. And in these movies, there's, you know, motorcycle riding, there's horseback riding, there's... Yeah, I remember when that promotional photo came out of uh, Keanu Reeves on a horseback ri uh, fighting people, and everybody's like, holy shit. <laughs> and yeah, that scene does live up to the hype. Oh yeah, no, the, the, the whole movie lives up to the hype. You know, it's, it, it's a fun one. So yep. uh, what else uh, What else you guys seen? Okay, so last Tuesday at the New Bev, I was there for the Grindhouse double feature, and this month they're doing all women-directed and or written movies. So for this Grindhouse double feature, they did uh, two by Jackie Kong, uh, The Being, and Blood Diner. And uh, I'm a big fan of The Being. Uh, it's like one of my favorite, like, just schlocky 80s creature features. And also, Idaho's first horror movie, and possibly their best. And uh, <laughs> uh, and I'd never seen Blood Diner before. And for those of you who don't know, that's kind of a loose remake of Herschel Gordon Lew Lewis's Blood Feast, uh, except in the 80s. And it was actually a lot of fun. Uh, it, it was very weird and very gory. And, uh, yeah, bo both had, were basically horror comedies, because, like, in The Being, it's, you know, it, like, played a little bit more seriously, but at the same time, it's, it's very weird. And, like, uh, like, it's got a great cast, too. Like, Martin Landau is in it. Uh, he plays, like, a government cleanup guy said, said to cover up, like, the nuclear waste next to the Idaho potato plant is causing mutations. And, um, yeah, and Blood, uh, Blood Diner, uh, that was a lot of fun, too. And it was way more wild than I, I expected it to be. And Jackie Kong was actually there, and it was very interesting hearing about her experience in making those movies, especially as, uh, you know, uh, a woman filmmaker, especially one of the few in the exploitation genre scene in the 80s. Now I have to watch Blood Diner. <laughs> uh, James, have you seen Blood Diner? I have not seen Blood Diner. I've seen The Being and I love The Being. I have not yeah. seen Blood Diner, though. Yeah, it's yeah, it's uh, better than I expected. And yeah, it's pretty fun. It's uh, yeah, like just because I'm not usually one for those cannibal movies, but uh, it. It is a very zany 80s horror comedy. Like, it has some good bits in there. I have seen Blood Feast, if that counts for anything, but... Yeah, if you, well, if you like Blood, Blood Feast, you'll love Blood Diner. <laughs> I, I haven't been avoiding it. I just haven't gotten around to it. Uh, what about you, Korea? You seen anything good? Uh, well, I've mostly been working. Uh, show's been uh, I'm working on right now is ramping up pretty hard, so... Um, haven't been able to really uh, watch anything of recent... Um, I did get to uh, be the center of a uh, blood test uh, the nice. other day. So uh, they hooked me up with hoses and I <laughs> and it made it look like I got stabbed in the chest. Also, oh, I do have to say this. Um, there, I've discovered a new site to buy Blu-rays from called HamiltonBooks.com. Oh, yeah. Hmm. I've, but now, be careful, though, because I bought some stuff from them and I get probably two catalogs a week from them now. You they do? will f they will flood your mailbox with stuff. <laughs> oh See, I I haven't gotten anything from their mailbox. All I know is my package came in. I spent like fifty bucks, and I got like ridiculous amount of of Blu-rays from them. Like they they had this one deal where it was all independent films, like what Maisie knew, 
Bad Lieutenant Porter called New Orleans, the Joan Rivers documentary. It was a good mixture of like 10 movies for 10 bucks. Like, so I got a lot of horror films from there, like Bat People. I'm really stoked to start digging into those. I got Trilogy of Terror. Yeah. Uh, nice. Thing from Kino from them. And, and it was like six bucks. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're ridiculously cheap. And it's across the board with like the levels of stuff. Like it's like Bat People is new Scream Factory. So that's like 18 bucks on Amazon. Got it for six bucks on there. Got the Amityville Horror Remake for like three bucks. And this is new stuff too. Yeah. I mean, th- this isn't used, which is weird. It's like, how do they get this stuff so cheap? Don't care. Um, I own it now. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> Don't care. I know that uh, the digital codes work, so you know that they're not just repackaging used stuff. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And, and they got a lot of new titles on there, too, that are already going down in price on it. So uh, keep it, I'm refreshing my browser on that once a week, at least. Again, great deal. So, uh, yeah. But outside of that, I did see uh, – actually, I did see Detective Pikachu last night. Yes. I don't know if we discussed that. Well, no, because it's been – we do this biweekly. I don't know yeah. if that's horror enough for us, though. It's not, but it was delightful. <laughs> and that's all I have to say. And I got uh, – okay, well, going back into horror and things I just watched, uh, I saw this month's Into the Dark, you know, the uh, Blumhouse oh, yeah, produced the Hulu. Hulu series. Yeah. And this is probably my favorite one yet. Uh, for Mother's Day, they – they did this one called All That We Destroyed, directed by Chelsea Stardust. And it's basically about this uh, mom who's a scientist specializing in genetics and cloning. And her son uh, kills a dude, uh, kills a woman uh, because he's like, tur- he's slowly turning into a serial killer. So she comes up with, with her own idea of how to uh, stifle his serial killer tendencies by repeatedly cloning the same victim over and over again so that he'll get it out of his system or something and it's uh man it's really great it's a kind of a classic uh nature versus nurture science fiction story with a lot of horror elements feels very black mirror or twilight zone-ish that's what i was gonna say it sounds like an episode of, the, of black mirror yeah, yeah. I mean, it's got a bit of that aesthetic because, you know, it's kind of a near future type of story, but it's uh, really well done and there is a, a, a lot of tension. Uh, I, re- I really dug it. Best Mother's Day horror movie yet. Better, better than, than Mother's, Mother's Day. Day. Yeah. <laughs> I did like it better than Mother's Day. I will say that. Even better than the remake of Mother's Day? Yes. Which was also a lot of fun? Yeah, no, this was, this was, uh, I I felt like this one was more intense and just, I'm a a big fan of sci-fi horror and, uh, and yeah, like the dynamic was really good. So yeah, I'd I'd recommend it. Another thing I saw that, um, this is going to kind of be a little teaser of our main topic, but there's this documentary that just came out called Scary Stories. Yeah. Which is about... The Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark series of books. Um, this is not to be confused with uh, Del Toro's movie from that's coming out this summer. This is a documentary about those books, and it talks to um, other writers. I mean, it talks like R.L. Stein and you know other nice. writers. It talks to librarians who worked in school libraries where the books were banned, <laughs> and they t- they tell the stories about how their principals will come in and say, we need to take this off the shelves, and they'd be like, have you read them yet? You know, that kind of thing. Oh, and God. it talks to um to the guys, uh, Alvin Schwartz is the writer, and it talks to his kid. It, it was really interesting. It's one of, It was kind of one of those perfect storm things that I, you know, it released right to VOD, so it popped up on Vudu, and I happened to have $10 worth of Vudu credits, and it was nine ninety nine. I'm like, oh, you know what? I'm on this. So it was kind of one of those, you know, perfect storm impulse buys for me. But it it's uh, it's if you love those books, it's really interesting to to see, you know, and, and they show like um a musician who basically has has written songs of all of the stories. And st- I mean, it's it, it's a pretty cool little peek behind the curtain of those of those books. Hmm. Uh, is there anything else that we've seen or do we want to move on to our subgenre? Um. Okay, well, I got uh, one other quick thing. Uh, they added a bu- they added a couple of Mike Mendez movies to Amazon Prime, including one I've been dying to see for a while. Uh, yeah, for those uh, you know, Mike Mendez, he did like uh, Big Ass Spider and he and Tales of Halloween. Uh, they they added some of his earlier movies to Prime, including uh, his first movie called Killers, which I immediately loved because it is just like pure '90s like 
disturbing uh, horror like crime movie type stuff with a lot of comedy on top uh, it's kind of like in the same vein of natural born killers it's basically about these two brothers who are killers and killed their parents they're kind of based off the Menendez brothers who break out of prison they hold the family hostage but then things get really turned on their heads it's really crazy and they also added the convent uh, which was a horror comedy he did in the, in the early 2000s with Adrian Barbeau which you know kids break into a nunnery where a lot of murders happened and uh, you got a bunch of demonic nuns uh, coming out of the woodwork both were great uh, and uh, had a fun time watching them cool let's move on to our subgenre what do you got for us this bye week well this is a good segue because yeah i've just been really deep diving into prime video lately and uh i caught uh the, this movie um the ruins which i feel is com- it comes from a specific era or you know a cyclical era of wanderlust horror you know like tourists uh, uh, going out of their element and getting caught up in all kinds of ho- horrific stuff uh while traveling so i figured we'd talk about stuff like that you know stuff like uh hostel or uh, tourist trap you know like vacations gone awry with you know usually a bunch of annoying american backpackers i think you you've just uh covered the entire gamut because you said tourist trap and hostel <laughs> <laughs> yeah i guess there's a couple of spectrums there T- uh, tourist trap is really the original of these I think with the annoying kids who get lost and they find a swimming hole and then uh, nothing good ever happens from dipping your uh, feet into the wrong swimming hole in a horror movie. Especially when it's next to like, uh, what was it? Just like uh, kind of a mannequin museum or something? Yeah, it, yeah it's, it's like a, like a, it's a tourist trap. It's like one of those roadside, you know, haunted house kind of a things, but it's, yeah, it's full of weird mannequins and toys and which as someone who's traveled across america a few times via via, uh, via car who is a sucker for ooh world's largest yarn ball um, <laughs> let me tell you tourist traps are creepy as hell and what's even better than actual tourist traps are the ones that are abandoned those are a lot of fun there's a couple of ones like uh, i know there's one out there where it's like a flintstone amusement park that's been abandoned Stuff like that. Oh, yeah. They're real creepy to to explore. Uh, but don't trespass people, please. Yeah. <laughs> and and the hostile movies are kind of the other end of the spectrum. They Those are kind of the gold standard for these wanderlust things. Because, I mean, what's... You've got these Americans, you know, in Eastern Europe and... Gold standard? Well, <laughs> actually, I, the first two hostile movies I really love. But uh, <laughs> they... Uh, I, I think... I mean, when I say gold standard, I don't mean quality. I mean, that's what people think of. Um, quality hostel. Hey, <laughs> I think that that the first two are really good, honestly. Ah. And and the best thing about the second one is I think it concentrates almost as much on the killers as it does on the victims, which is really cool. I think because it gets into their head too, and you get to see you know the guy who's got second thoughts and the guy who's just completely meatheaded about it, and then how that spoiler alert for a movie that's what ten years old that kind of flips <laughs> yep. and the and the the guy with second thoughts goes all in and the guy who's all in is like oh no man <laughs> so, <laughs> so is is this gonna turn in, i'm not gonna let this turn into me bitching about hostile nah. you, you've yeah. done a lot of bitching lately <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, it's just eli roth he, he like his scripts are fine and then he finds one really dumb thing to include in it that just like push pushes me over the edge and hostile the whole kids with the gum bit oh. like come on that's like the kid with the nunchucks and boner and fucking uh cabin fever that's why i never finished green inferno just like that first 20 minutes was just no did you get to the plane crash no i couldn't dude you, those characters dude. would not stop talking and they oh, were no. annoying as all hell the dialogue in that movie is is completely brainless but you yeah. have to get to the plane crash the pl- it's the best plane crash since final destination <laughs> at least I fast couldn't. forward to the plane crash all right, or just look up the clip on YouTube. Screen Factory is going to force me to watch it with uh, their <laughs> with their collector's edition, so I'll give it a second chance then. Yeah, but and yeah, yeah, I guess a lot of uh, Eli Roth's uh, filmography is in the realm of Wanderlust Horror because he also well he didn't 
direct, but he produced, and I think he co-wrote, oh, and also he starred in that movie uh, Aftershocks, you know, about the friends on vacation, and uh, I think it's uh, Chile uh, that gets hit by an earthquake, and they deal with all kinds of crazy stuff. (laughs) And yeah, yeah, and I I feel like it's kind of (laughs) somewhere beats with uh, what Jonathan was saying. But yeah, I feel like in the 2000s specifically, there was a wave of wanderlust horror movies you know like the horrors that could be fall americans traveling abroad like, like uh, teristas that, yeah i was just about to say teristas. Yeah, teristas that that one was was pretty that one was pretty wild that one was right in the the wake of the hostile movies or the first yeah. hostile movie i think because because i remember it was one of those you you thought hostile was bad teristas is you know it was yeah. one of those supposedly <laughs> more brutal than and it was and it was awesome. I don't know about that, but yeah. I liked it more. And then there's House of a Thousand Corpses, which is... Uh, yeah, that counts. Them driving around looking at tourist traps um, until they find the wrong one. <laughs> yeah. I feel like this uh, genre could be uh, split up between the 70s and the 2000s. Like I, those, I was about those to say, specifically. in the 70s, we had one of the ultimate tourist backpacking going into the wrong place movies and that's uh, American Werewolf in London you know yeah, that's yeah. literally them backpacking through uh, the moors and they just happen to it wasn't a tourist trap but you know it was an English bar yeah like, the most English bar you could possibly ever walk into yeah stay off the moors yeah stay <laughs> out of the moors good advice to stay but stick by by the way and uh i have to say one of my favorites uh would probably have to be uh just before dawn you guys seen mm-hmm. that yeah. No. Uh, yeah. It's well. It's mostly a slasher movie, but I. F- but it definitely counts as kind of wanderlust horror because it's about uh, this group of college kids who decide to go backpacking out in this uh, res not not reservation, but a c- conservation. You know, like a section of um, like a national park. Kind yeah, of it's thing. like a national yeah. park. Like they're going out to like you know a place untouched by nature and you know to see the crystal clear uh, springs and stuff and then there's like a, a maniac on the loose uh, with a big ass knife was that before or after the Friday the 13th movies or was it in the uh, this was them? before this was okay. uh, kind of a predecessor slasher movie because okay. this is like uh, late 70s I'd say so it was before like Final Terror and The Burning and all the other uh, in the woods yeah, slashers yeah. okay uh, and, and also around that era I think this uh, definitely counts The Hills Have Eyes because you got this family they're going on a uh, 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 RV vacation and they end up in uh, the Badlands with the mutants. We can't talk about these kind of movies without mentioning Deliverance. Oh, of course. Yes. Which of course. is, which is, uh, it, I mean, <laughs> Ooh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, questionably horror, but who, I don't think anybody would want to go through what those guys went through. Oh, it's so. definitely horror. Dude, no, just, just those, <laughs> and I know we're, we're, everyone's thinking of the infamous scene, but just afterwards, a lot of people don't talk about afterwards that sense of, being watched, being followed, that paranoia where they're going down the river trying to get out is some of the most intense and terrifying things. If you've ever been lost in the woods or just gone through off the trail and there's always that sense of something watching you and deliverance gave you a reason to be scared of something watching you yeah, or someone and I- and and similar to that, have either of you guys seen the movie Rituals? The Netflix one that was no, uh, no, no. Although, although actually, that one could kind of count too. That one does too. That's that's kind of like a deliverance. Although I was theme. thinking, uh, although I was thinking, uh, the seven, uh, I think it was the late seventies or early eighties. This movie Rituals came out. It was made in Canada. It was basically about this group of friends who were like all doctors. They take an annual or. Uh, nature hike where they're literally dropped from uh, a plane into the Canadian wilderness and then hike their way back to civilization except this time somebody's watching them and like they st- and like they steal their shoes so they have to go barefoot the rest of the way and all kinds of crazy stuff happens. I watched it on like one of the streaming services and it was really intense and uh, Code Red or Scorpion or one of those released a Blu-ray of it recently. But yeah Rituals, the new one on Netflix from a, a year or two back, that's a good one and and yeah, I feel like that um, that definitely counts as wanderlust horror because it's about a group of friends that are dealing with the loss of a friend, and so they decide to go out into the wilderness to deal with their issues, only to encounter like an unspeakable evil out out in the 
like they did, they're in Norway, right, or Sweden? I I am not sure. I think is I think that one is just called the ritual, isn't the, it? Right, right. The ritual. yeah. Okay, so so there is a difference between the ritual and rituals. Yep. Tomato, I mean, tomato. Obviously. Well, yeah. more more than just a name, there's a difference, but there's yeah. a difference in the names of those two movies too. Yeah, uh, yeah, I really like that one, and and yeah, that definitely falls into the realm of Wonderlust horror because I feel like a lot of underlying themes with these movies is like these people have a lot of issues, so they figure, hey, let's go out into the middle of nowhere, or this faraway place, to deal with our personal problems, and you know, kind of manifests in like some kind of terror killer that gets that goes after them did you guys see the signal that movie from like maybe five years ago or so Uh, no uh, i think i know which one you're talking about though i i think um olivia cook i think is in it and uh uh brenton thwaites and lawrence fishburne yeah lawrence fishburne it's it's a these three kids they're on this cross-country trip i think they're driving the girl to go to college in california and the two guys are like these computer hacker guys and they keep getting messages from from this one computer troll who always torments them and they find out that they're near where he's transmitting these messages they're like oh let's go pay him a visit <laughs> and you know of course it is not it, it turns into uh it turns science fictiony really quickly it's mm. not so much it's more it's more science fiction than horror, but it's uh that's a that that one I think qualifies as well. Here's my thing. I think Wonderlust subgenre should re- is is going to make a comeback. I don't know about you guys. What makes but you say that? Millennials. <laughs> Seriously. Like how how isn't there like a slew of movies of millennials going out and trying to live blog in places they shouldn't be <laughs> or re- or just going on there like what is it um breaks you know to travel the world like if, if you see so many articles about uh people dropping everything to travel the world like how isn't there horror movies about that or you know edc's this weekend why isn't there horror films that take place at uh more uh festivals and stuff like that mm. i mean we do have midsummer coming up which kind of oh, sounds yeah yeah that like that it could definitely be. looks like it could count as wanderlust horror because you know you got yeah, you know, I mean, you got a couple of young people traveling to a faraway place. They got their personal issues, and shit's going to go bad for them. That we can tell. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really excited for Midsummer. Yeah. I just think that the Wonderless subgenre is something that we'll, we're going to be seeing a lot more of, possibly. And unfortunately, it's going to lend itself real well to the found footage uh, style of filmmaking because I'm a, I'm a sucker for found footage. Oh, movies. me too. I will, me too. I will always watch them, but I will also admit that eight out of ten of them are really bad, <laughs> and that's a generous. You know, saying that two of them are good out of every ten is actually pretty generous. But that's <laughs> me. That's me being a sucker for the genre. But I'll yeah. always watch them because when it's done well, it's done really effectively. Oh yes. Again, Willow's Creek, man, still I think is the yeah. is the most realistic and effective uh, found footage film out there. Is that the Bigfoot one? That's is that Bobcat Gold? Yeah, the Bobcat Goldfoot one. Yep. You know that. And uh, oh man, just that had one of the greatest jump scares in a horror movie. That had one of the most intense scenes just in the tent when like you hear the noises and like and it's so simple and effective. And I know exactly how they did a lot of the stuff, but it didn't matter because they just nailed it so well. Yeah, no, like uh, that that definitely counts as Wanderlust horror too because it's about a couple, you know, following the Bigfoot trails uh, on a vacation. Yeah. And well, it's their it's their honeymoon. They wanted to right, go and try to right, see Right, right. She wanted to just go camping. He he's looking for Bigfoot and yeah. Didn't he kind of trick her into uh, looking for Bigfoot like they weren't yeah. supposed to be doing that? And she's like, fine. There were a bunch of movies around that same time that were like found footage Bigfoot movies. So there was like that Exists one. Right, yeah. Um, Happy Camp, I think is what it's called. There were, there were a handful of them that... And I think that Bigfoot hunting lends itself to good found footage... I mean, well, I won't say good found footage. It lends itself <laughs> well to found footage. <laughs> it's a good premise. Well, well, isn't isn't that footage of Bigfoot, the supposed the famous infamous with the arms going back and stuff? Isn't that kind of the original found footage? Pretty much, technically. <laughs> I mean, depending on be. whether you believe it's real or not, could be. And uh, kind of off note, but uh, so, somebody else brought this up that uh, haven't been as many UFO, Bigfoot, or like monster sightings uh, so much in recent years, despite the fact there's even more cameras than ever. Kind of weird in it well that's because bigfoot chooses who he wants to be seen by <laughs> and he exists on more than one plane do we do, do i 
need to read my paper to you guys about Big Brother? Well, uh, well, we may save that for another topic. <laughs> I think we've already talked about Sasquatches, so go back to that episode if you really want to hear. Well, mm-hmm. James, that's already we already know that. That was proven with the ending of uh, Harry and the Hendersons, that they can reveal themselves <laughs> yep. who they want to. Yes. Let's move on to our topic, which we kind of hinted at uh, a little earlier when I talked about scary stories uh which kind of peel back the curtain on the scary stories to tell in the dark books. Uh, We're going to talk about movies that peel back the curtain on your favorite horror movies, you know, basically making of or behind the scenes documentaries. And I think the ones that come to mind most quickly for me, at least are uh, the two epics uh, crystal Lake memories and never sleep again, which crystal Lake memories is like six hours about the Friday, the 13th franchise and never sleep again is four or four and a half hours about a night. Nightmare on Elm Street. And I think they're both uh, by Daniel Ferrans, who we talked about because he did uh, the Amityville murders and and uh, the haunting of Sharon Tate. And I think I mentioned that he, I, I think he's uh, the reason he's into those true life stories is because he he's he's a documentarian, I think, at heart. And you can tell that from his movies. But uh, have you guys seen either of those? Um, I've watched chunks. Like, I haven't watched all of them in full, but I've watched, like, specific chapters, you know, mostly about, you know, the certain movies from either franchise. I loved uh, Never Sleep Again. I liked how they went through each movie individually, gave them all the same amount of time and kind of uh, care to go through it. And hearing the cast and crew talk about... Uh, a Nightmare on Elm Street 2 is just incredible. Um, hearing all the stories and how oblivious they were to a lot of those uh, <laughs> overtones mm-hmm. for some of them. Some of some of the cast and crew knew exactly what they were making. Well, I was oblivious to it. I think I told you guys this. When I saw that as a 15-year-old kid, I just thought it was a cool Freddy Krueger movie. It's only watching it 20 years later, I'm like, oh, this is a pretty gay movie. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, I didn't even realize the homosexual undertones when I was a teenager. I just rolled with it. And I'm like, okay, cool. This is a cool little horror movie. And I think it makes it better because imagine if it was just like a new uh, girl that Freddie was coming after. It would be pretty straightforward and kind of boring. But it's those overtones that really make that movie so much fun to watch. The funny thing about both of those documentaries, Crystal Lake Memories and Never Sleep Again, is they're exhaustively long they're i mean they're very in-depth but they're not boring at all to watch you can sit there and you're like oh you know let me watch an hour an hour and a half of this and then i'll you know tap out and come back and watch the rest later you'll end up sitting through all of never sleep again in one big four hour chunk and it won't even feel like you sat there on your couch for four hours and crystal light memories is the same way it's like you know if by the time they get to the end, you're like, damn, I just watched over six hours of them talking about Friday the 13th, and I loved every minute of it. Yeah, it's pretty insane. And I have to say, I'm so thankful for those two movies, because I think it's because of those two where we kind of have been experienced kind of like a golden era of documentaries specifically about horror movies. There's uh, one about Salem's Lot. There's one about Creep Show that came out recently. Yeah, uh, Just Desserts. Just Desserts. There was a Return of the Living Dead one, too. Yep. There's a Pet Cemetery one that just came out uh, not too long ago as well. Have either of you guys seen Lost Souls? I think it, or no, Lost Soul. It's, yes. oh, it's yeah, yeah. about the, Richard Stanley. Yes. That, that one is nuts. The stuff that went, I want to see a fictionalized account <laughs> of the behind the scenes. Oh, my of God. Because it's about um, Island of Lost Souls. The, uh, Richard do- Stanley, the Island of Dr. Moreau. Yeah, the Island of Dr. Moreau. So, so it's about the 90s one with Val Kilmer and um, Richard Stanley uh, was was directing it and then he got fired. But then they talked to him in this documentary. He basically snuck back on the set with with a with a beast mask and got kind of back into his movie because he dressed up as one of the characters. It's the craziest story. And that is an oversimplification. There is yeah, so yeah. much like... My favorite part is uh, is him talking about how he tried to have a uh, wizard friend of his bless the movie, but it turned into a curse. <laughs> yeah. That's that's a great one if you've got... I, I mean, it's. It, I don't even think it's that long. I think it's like maybe an hour and a half. Yeah, so it's that's... a fairly simple runtime, but yeah, it's an amazing in-depth documentary on, <laughs> on just how bad a movie can go. <laughs> and it's well worth getting the uh, Severin 3 disc because the special features, there's so much more to explore 
uh, getting into those other two discs mm-hmm. with it. And it co- I believe it comes with a soundtrack, too. And also talking uh, more recent horror docs, I have to say one of my favorites uh, to come out recently, in fact, just last year, w- uh, which I've brought up before, is Horror Noir, you know, which is about uh, black filmmakers, audiences, and uh, kind of the uh, uh, perceivings of black people in horror throughout the years from the inception of cinema itself to today. It was such a great documentary, and it had such a great list of uh, people who were interviewed. You know, you got Rachel True and Tony Todd and Keith David, and, you know, you could just go on and on. And And it interviews them in pairs. It pairs them up, so it's not really... Yeah, so it's not really like, you know, a talking head thing. It's like a conversation between these two people. So it, it, it really feels natural with these conversations. And I think they did a good job of pairing of of putting together the pairings too yeah keith david and tony todd singing the monster mash was a great extra <laughs> i still want that like i need that mp3 on my ipod or as a single on vinyl <laughs> have you guys both seen uh, room 237 yes. yes that one is weird because it's not really about the movie well it is yeah. but it's about the the weird conspiracy theories that um overzealous viewers have come up with about the shiny and you know like saying that um there are clues in there about how kubrick faked his his confession that he faked the moon landing (laughs) or um that there's uh that it's about like a native american oppression or i mean it's i think there's like six or seven of these i mean i use the term loosely nut jobs that they (laughs) talk to about this but it's funny because if you're going to watch room 237 you need to watch the shining one more time before you do it because the shining will never have the same innocence to it again you you will always see the stuff that is pointed out by room 237 every time you watch the shining so um if you're going to watch room 237 watch the shining just one last time first just to just to preserve your your innocence on it yeah but every time i rewatch the shining i get a different perspective on it so it's just yeah but that's adding a whole nother level of to it do you guys remember uh terror in the aisles yeah yeah i've never actually seen it but i've watched clips well that's all it is is clips it's um it's it's like one of those it's almost it almost strikes me as one of those um hundred scariest horror movie kind of things mm-hmm. but but it, it's narrated by uh donald pleasance and nancy allen and they basically take you through a bunch of horror movies and they show you know they'll talk about you know like like there's one scene where they talk about the final girl and she's always more vulnerable in the bathroom and then they show like a bunch of scenes of them getting killed in bathrooms it's it's really i mean that's kind of the original i think it's from 82 so it was like the golden age of the slasher movie but there's a lot of non-slasher that like like there's a weird amount of it is dedicated to Nighthawks, the Sylvester Stallone oh, um, undercover movie. Yeah, or like Ms. 45 has a bunch in it, oh, too. Yeah. It's. I think that um, the studio that made it may have kind of uh, loaded it with their own movies, which is fine. I mean, that's within their rights right. to do. Uh, although off of that, I really was a big fan of Bravo's 100 Scariest Movie Moments uh, when that came out. Uh, and I mean, that was just really fun because you basically had uh, like a whole bunch of different people, you know, from all sorts of uh, walks of pop culture talking about some of the scariest horror movies and some of the specifically scariest scenes from those horror movies. Like one of my favorite bits was when they were talking about Child's Play and they had the dudes from Broken Lizard uh, yeah. talking about it. And they're like, uh, it's not that I'm afraid of dolls. I just want to know where they are at all times. Yeah, and and that was a huge introductory uh, for me as a kid because I was like, yeah. for for me living in the woods, that was almost pre-internet, so that exposed me to a lot of horror films I didn't know about. Especially uh, that was my introduction to Freaks. Actually, yeah, yeah, it went pretty deep dive, and yeah, it was from around like uh, I want to say two thousand three, so it exposed a lot of people to a lot of horror movies they wouldn't have uh, wouldn't have otherwise have known about. That's kind of what Terror in the Isles did for me because I saw I remember on HBO one Halloween they showed Halloween, Night of the Living Dead, Chud, and Terror in the Isles, and I recorded it. So all of these movies that were in you know, and, and I was like eleven, and all these movies that are in this um. In this movie, I, you know, I, I was like, really, this is a thing, you know, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know the, that was kind of my gateway. Terry Niles might have been my gateway to the horror genre at that point. I mean, I, I had obviously seen horror movies, but that was the one where I was like, all right, I, I could get comfortable with this. Yeah. And that's why I think uh, documentaries about horror are particularly important, because a lot of them serve as kind of a gateway into horror for a lot of people or it steers them towards movies and subjects they wouldn't have otherwise known about. Have you guys 
guys seen uh, 7852? The, the, um, the, the psycho shower oh, scene? Oh, uh, no, movie? I didn't see that. Not <laughs> yet, no. It's weird because it supposedly is about, um, I want to say 7852, it refers to the number of seconds and the number of camera setups there are, I think. Oh. And and I don't know which is which. I don't know if it's uh, 78 setups in 52 seconds or if it's... Uh, it's like how many edits and... Um, I think it's... Yeah, I think it's cuts and edits. Uh, oh, is, oh is it. okay. So it's not even time. But it um, it's weird because it's not really... It is about the shower scene. It totally is. But it's much more than... It doesn't just dissect that scene. It, it talks to people involved with it. And it, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty crazy documentary considering it is about basically just one pivotal scene. Although it's not really. It's more about the whole movie. And uh, another one i got to bring up is uh, Best Worst Movie, you know, that documentary about <laughs> Troll 2. Troll 2. And yes, fun- funnily yes. enough, I'm in that. You are? Yeah. Well, I mean, not, you know, I don't have, like, a big scene or anything, but, like, uh, basically they shot uh, some footage at the Brattle Theater in Boston when they were taking the movie on tour, and you can see me in a group hug with the cast and crew with uh, some of my friends. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, that was a lot of fun. And it is interesting, you know... Especially because I feel like, especially particularly around that time in the in the uh, late 2000s, early 2010s, people were really getting into, you know, like, r- so bad it's good horror movies. And Troll 2 uh, almost, be- you know, became mimetic in uh, how funnily bad it was. Uh, so it's interesting kind of going behind the curtain and seeing just who was involved and, like, what went into that. And, you know, and, like, all the stuff with uh, the Italian director Claudio Fragrasso is gold dude, because of how intense he is yeah not to mention uh george hardy like he really is like that in real life we tried yeah. booking him at our movie theater in new hampshire with a best worst movie troll 2 thing uh it didn't work out but the first time i talked to him on the phone he he wouldn't let us get to wouldn't let me get to business because he was just like i was watching the social network last night have you seen that movie i'm like yeah he's like how does it end? I didn't finish. I didn't get to finish it. I'm like, oh, okay. So I spent like ten minutes explaining the ending to the Social Network to the dad from Troll Two, and uh, you know, did you make it up though? Did you give him the real ending? No, no, no. I I told him, but it was it was just great because I was just like, wow, this is all, well. Luke and Han destroyed the Death Star. <laughs> And Rosebud was his sled. You should have just made shit up. Oh, God. He was just like, did he get back together with her? And I was like, oh, buddy, you focused on the wrong parts of this oh. movie. Oh, That's not goodness. what the movie's about, but okay. <laughs> yeah, he, although he was a really nice guy. Uh, I met him a couple times, and yeah, he's he's just very genuine, you know? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it, it was a fascinating documentary because, you know, like we all have our favorite, best, worst movies. So, you know, just to see, you know, the people behind it. No, exactly. Uh, another one I really liked was was the one that we kind of briefly went over, uh, More Brains, the Return of the Living Dead documentary. Ah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's another one that's very thorough. Um, it is a special feature on, I believe it's uh, sc- on Scream Factory's Collector's Edition for Return of the Living Dead, but it's well worth getting like the full blue re- or full DVD that they put out years ago be- just because it is, uh, you know, more more talking about it. And they went through each one i don't think they covered rafe to the grave and the other one that thoroughly uh, though uh, necropolis but necropolis yeah but the last set about those films the better yeah oh yeah <laughs> they're only return of living dead movies in name really <laughs> pretty much but um yeah no the, those were some good that, that was a good documentary too and like we were saying earlier it's cool that never sleep again and crystal lake memories open the door to a lot of individual horror movies that have their own fan bases uh you know again their own documentaries like that like uh wasn't there one about monster squad that came out recently yeah, uh, yeah. wolfman's got nards yeah yeah i don't know if it's gone um theatrical or gotten a physical or home release yet but it was pretty good i mean the the issue that you're that it's kind of running into is if if the documentary is about the film they're obviously going to have that perspective on the experience of making the film which each film has its own unique experience so there's going to be cool stories coming out of that but if you're making a film about the fans of a film or a film series 
you kind of get into that that same kind of storyline, you know. So like, uh, Wolfman's Got Nards, I enjoyed it, but it was it was almost like, oh, okay, so this is best worst movie, but with Monster Squad, where you're yeah. talking about the ded- dedication of the fans, and it's cool giving them that spotlight, but you're hitting a lot of the same notes, and it kind of almost becomes repetitive after a period of time. Mm. There's this movie called uh, Feeding Frenzy that I saw, which basically goes through the Sharknado movies. Oh God. And and it is uh, it doesn't go through all of them because I think it's a few years old, so it might only go through the first four. But it, it it's hilarious because everybody kind of treats Sharknado as a joke, and it when it talks to um it talks to uh I, I'm blanking on his name Steve from nine hundred two hundred Ian Zeering is that his name? It, when it talks to him, he basically was saying that um the reason he did it is because his wife was about to have a baby and he needed to do another movie so that he could get his SAG. Uh, medical benefits you know he 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 needed to qualify to get so he basically did it for the medical benefits um and then tara reed was kind of the same and it wasn't for medical benefits but it was like the and when when they signed on to do it it was called uh something else like like out into the dark or some or out of the dark or something like that because no one would sign on to do the movie if it was called sharknado (laughs) (laughs) everyone was like i'm not gonna be in a movie called sharknado oh god Uh, but obviously, obviously they changed their mind on it, though. I feel like it was kind of a snakes on a plane situation. Well, now it is. But now they embrace it. Like when they talk, they're like, you know, because when the first one came out, it went viral on Twitter. I mean, it was totally trending yeah, because everyone of, was uh, watching BJ it. McDonald or, or, you know, the guy from The Office was tweeting about it. That's, that's BJ Novak. Saying. BJ Novak. Yeah. All these huge, you know, people with huge following started tweeting about it. So people started watching it. And when they all came to um, came to work that Monday or, you know, whatever, they're, they're like, you know, you're, actually, I think Tara Reid was she was on vacation uh, in Mexico when it aired. And when she came back, people are like, you're not going to believe this. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like Sharknado is a thing. I mean, people love it. And uh, so by the time they went to make the other ones, um, they started embracing the silliness of it. You know, Ian Ziering talks about how he's all, wait, I get eaten by a shark and then I carve my way out with a chainsaw. How awesome is that? Yeah. <laughs> you know? And he's right. It's awesome. Yeah. And there's like six of them now, isn't it? <laughs> oh my god uh, so many yeah there's i think there are there might be six yeah uh, i, I kind of dropped out after two. Oh no they're those movies well they keep getting stupider but yeah. that's what's so much fun about them yeah i think the fourth one was called the fourth awakens i think yeah yeah <laughs> and it's in space <laughs> yeah and i think the last one involved time travel <laughs> and it's called about yeah. time yeah <laughs> See, is it really yeah it's Shark a- NATO about time it's well, about time yeah like it's about time this franchise ended yeah. <laughs> but so it's not a play on the amityville it's about time. probably though too i mean <laughs> i have i haven't yet to watch any of the sharknado movies but i would be super down to watch a documentary about them it's called feeding frenzy it's probably on youtube you know it's uh it's it's and it's it's a short i think it's i mean it's less than an hour and a half it's maybe an hour and 20 minutes so it's a pretty quick little watch and uh, another documentary i like that uh seems to pop up a bunch on on streaming is uh um, nightmares in red white and blue you know that documentary about american horror movie yeah uh, about american horror movies uh because yeah that one's got a lot of great uh interviews you know you got wes craven george romero and you know it's uh, it's like i I like historical horror documentaries you know kind of examining the eras because a lot of it goes into you know like uh the gritty 70s and you know the turn in the 80s so you know i I do like you know kind of when it um you know when they talk about you know kind of how the pop culture mirrored uh, the culture, you know, it was like a funhouse mirror to the culture at the time, you know, like how horror movies responded to Vietnam and uh, uh, Cold War and all that. Yeah, that's what Nightmares in uh, Red, White and Blue is. It's It basically shows you what was going on in America when these movies were made. It, it, it kind of, like you said, it holds up a mirror. It's like, oh, this is what influenced these movies yeah. because this is what was happening. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a really interesting uh, one that that um, where you kind of get to see what was in what was happening in the country when these movies were being made. Mm. Well, it's really cool because I I think horror is the ultimate horror and sci fi. Like once you get into genre films, they they are very reflective and uh, can make really great commentary of whether they intend to or not 
of the time. Even, uh, you know, a lot of people dismiss Return of Living Dead, but there's many themes of, you know, addiction when you had like the whole meth ep- epidemic happening at the time. Um, uh, STDs, you had the AIDS epidemic going on, and there's a huge critique on uh, the Cold War and Reagan era politics uh, hidden within a punk rock zombie movie, you know? So it, I always love watching documentaries that dive into that. Same. Cool. What else we got? Um, I also really like the uh, Leviathan documentary and the uh, Arrow H- Hellraiser Blu ray. You know, like, they they made a pretty comprehensive... Well, uh, I'm not sure if it's on the regular release, but I got, like, you know, the box set they they, uh, they released a bit ago, and it's got a uh, comprehensive uh, documentary about kind of, like, the origins and adaptation for Hellraiser, and they talk with, uh, like, Doug Bradley and Clive Barker and all those guys. So, it, it you know, just... Um, it, it is interesting to kind of see how uh, Barker himself adapted it from his own book to screen. Have either of you guys seen the Canon films? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. One, it's, it's Electric called Electric Boogaloo. Boogaloo. Yeah, the wild untold story of Canon films. That one, it's not exclusively horror, as you can tell by it being called Electric Boogaloo. <laughs> right. it, it, it goes through, because the can, Canon films were just kind of, I mean, they. my favorite part is when they ta- when Canon films split and both of them rushed to get their Lombada movies out. Yeah. <laughs> there was yeah. a race to see who was going to get, uh, l- you know, there was the Forbidden Dance <laughs> and Lombada. <laughs> and they, like, it was a race to see who could get theirs. Because they knew that that trend, you know, had a pretty short shelf life. So they were... Well, it's, it's also just so interesting to hear people talk like we're trying to make our next breaking you know we're trying to find the next breaking and it's like yeah no one talks like that (laughs) like i don't think ever i think it's literally just those two men who ever talked like we need to make our next breaking and (laughs) it was labata (laughs) yeah it was interesting just to get a portrait of the Mannheim brothers um just you know and just kind of like they they were genuinely big fans of film and they wanted to make filmmakers and they had the craziest ideas for movies so it was just basically so you know when you boil it down it was just um you know a focus on how uh they wanted to be filmmakers and how they made some crazy movies (laughs) and that's uh if we're gonna be talking about fringe horror documentaries Hmm. another great one is uh not quite hollywood um, Ooh, which is about oh, yeah. the Ozploitation documentary. Yeah. And, I, and I'd say that's fringe because they do talk about movies like The Howling Three Marsupials, which, again, <laughs> is my second favorite howling movie. Nice. And my favorite marsupial werewolf movie. <laughs> um, but they do also talk about, like, just a lot of um, varied films. Like, at one moment they're talking about Picnic at Hanging Rock – Next, they're talking about Road Warrior. Then they're talking about the marsupials. And it's just insane what was coming out of Australia at the time. And that one is well worth uh, checking out. Hmm. Has anyone made a Canucksploitation documentary yet? Uh, I am. You <laughs> nice. I was, was going to say, let's get on that if we... <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, we should jump on that one. Kathy's Curse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I right, let's uh let, let's let's leave with Ozploitation yeah. being the taste in people's mouths <laughs> at the end of this episode. Interesting uh, way of putting it, James. <laughs> uh let's uh let's get out of here. Um yeah. our theme music as always is Restless Spirit and our artwork as always was done by Chris Fisher, so go and uh, check both of them out cuz they are both very talented artists. And uh me you can find on Twitter at Cinema Ferite, that's like Cinema Verite, but with fear, so it's F-E-A-R-I-T-E. Uh, where can we find you on Twitter, Jacob? Uh, you can find me at Jacob Davison underscore, that is at J-A-C-O-B-D-A-V-I-S-O-N underscore. And you, Korea? And you can find me on Twitter and Instagram under uh, Korean Barbecue, that's C-O-R-R-E-I-A-N-B-B-Q. And uh, don't forget to uh, also look us up on Stardust. Again, I'm promising to post on there more what I can. Uh, (laughs) Been a little lax with that lately, but 
We'll get there. And you can find all three of us at the Eye on Horror Facebook page. And you can find all three of us and several other talented writers at iHorror.com, which uh, is the reason that we are here. So go give some uh, love to iHorror. You can find they have a Facebook page, too. And mm-hmm. there's a fan group, which, you know, is hit or miss. But, <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's most fan groups. I mean, basically, yeah, we we uh, we at iHorror let our fan group page just kind of run itself a little yeah. bit you know we do monitor it we make sure we take we take we get rid of like offensive stuff you know but for the most part it's you know the maniacs taking over the asylum so if you want to get into some real i don't know man like that group it's it's interesting it's interesting <laughs> i'm getting tired of seeing the sparkly batman memes it's oh, like oh boy. you know what yeah robert pattinson is going to be an awesome batman see good times see high life see the rover that dude, dude can act okay yeah seriously <laughs> see any robert pattinson film in the last like six Six years and yeah. you'll see that like come i saw on. cosmopolis and i knew yeah. that uh, and actually that makes me feel like he'd actually pull off bruce wayne pretty damn well yeah, yeah. i think i think he's gonna be great but oh, yeah. anyway that's that's a topic for another day and uh we're getting out of here twilight was 10 years ago <laughs> shut the fuck up yeah stop yes. with the sparkly batman memes it's a movie for teenage girls why are you grown adults groaning about <laughs> someone who played a fucking vampire in a teenage girl movie 10 years ago for your fucking comic book movie calm down don't you have petitions to reshoot the whole last season of game of thrones to sign or something Uh, Uh, yeah okay now we're going down a rabbit hole and we're trying to get out of here so we're gonna get out of here (laughs) for me james j edwards i'm jacob davison and i'm jonathan korea keep your eye on horror